Hey there, it's Jason from Codemanship with another video diary entry. Before we start, if you're enjoying these videos, please like and subscribe to the channel and ring the bell for notifications. Okay, so today's video is going to attempt to answer the question, what is Agile Software Development? Um, and I think to answer that question, we probably need to go back and look at the history of software development methodologies. Now, I work with a lot of young developers, people who had relatively um, short experiences in the industry so far. Um, and it's clear that a lot of them are not aware of the kind of the origins of many of the, the tools and the techniques and the ideas that they're applying. So to un really understand agile software development, you need to go sort of back to the beginning, as it were. So we're going to go, yeah, we're going to jump in our time machine. Um, and we're going to travel back to the 1960s um, when there was what people described as a crisis in software, the, the software crisis. Essentially, as, as computers were getting more and more powerful and programs were getting larger and larger, the complexity of projects um, was starting to run out of control. So, you know, budget spiraling, um, schedules slipping majorly, quality problems and so on and so forth. So this idea started to emerge in the 1960s from many, many different people of um, software development as an engineering discipline, as opposed to like the small cottage industry that it was in the 1950s. Um, this idea of software engineering and this idea of software development methodology began to emerge from people like um, Edgar Dijkstra, for example, who was very influential in this, this early movement. Um, and um, you'll find many resources. There's a mention there on this wiki page of the NATO Software Engineering Conference in 1968. So this was when this term software engineering was starting to emerge and this idea that, that, that software could be done in a much more structured and a much more uh, well-managed way. Um, so Edgar Dijkstra came up with, with, a, with a, a, a process for designing software um, and delivering software called structured programming, for example, in the, the late 60s. Um, so this was like the origins of, of, of um, people suddenly finding that the, the, the programs they were working on were, were orders of magnitude larger than they were in the 1950s. The complexity of that was running out of control and they need to basically get a grip on that. So this idea of software engineering or software as an engineering discipline started to appear. There are many influential figures in that. Um, so this is around the time, and we're talking now maybe the early 70s, um, that people started to think a lot more deeply about these, these emerging software development processes, these methodologies, as they were called, that were beginning to emerge. Um, and one very influential paper that was written by Winston Royce um, talked about one of the risks of a certain way of approaching software development. So let's see if we can find that. Okay, so Winston Royce wrote a, a paper. He didn't describe it as the waterfall model. He didn't coin that term, but he talked about the risks of um, developing software in sort of very clearly defined phases of development. Like we, we gather all the requirements, then we do all the design, and then we write all the code, and then we, we test it, and then we deploy it, and then we maintain it. And he pointed out that um, there's a lot of risks inherent in this. How do we know that we're building the right thing? Um, if we're testing it at the end, how do we know that it's fit for release? Or maybe we need to go back and, and fix a bunch of stuff and so on and so forth. So in his paper, he sort of talked about how really we need to be able to revisit these phases, these activities, probably multiple times. So the idea of iterating software um, was being born in the early 70s, um, that we'd need to revisit the requirements, revisit the design and the architecture change the code, test it again, deploy it again, and so on and so forth. So this idea of iterating our designs was born. And in the mid-70s, um, another technique was, was beginning to sort of, in its infancy then, this idea of rapid prototyping, of building sort of low lo-fi prototypes of software um, to get feedback from users, sort of incorporates that, that idea that we're not, there's a lot we don't know at the beginning, um, and therefore we're probably going to have to take multiple passes um, so this idea of iterating was really beginning to form now. And when you think about it, it's common sense. The reality is, is we don't get it right first time, almost never, and therefore we do have to revisit. And therefore the way that we manage software development should take that into account rather than trying to ignore it. Now, having said that, there are a lot of people who misunderstood Winston Royce's paper and misunderstood the waterfall model. They didn't see it as a warning 
um, they saw it as the way to do it. So there are unfortunately um, many teams out there, many projects, and many project managers who think that waterfall is a real thing and that you can and should do it. Um, the reality is, is you never get it right, right first time. You do have to go back and revisit. Um, that's just physics, basically. That's the physics of software development. Um, so iterative is kind of the, the default uh, mode now. So that's a very key idea in, in agile software development, by the way, as we'll see. Okay, so we got a warning about waterfall. Now we're going to fast forward in our time machine to um, the mid 1980s. Um, and uh, we see this thing, um, it's described at the time as the spiral model of software development. So not a waterfall of stages or activities, um, but a spiral, whereas every time we go around the spiral, we, we do those waterfall steps. We look at the requirements and we do some design and we write some code and we test it and we release it. But we accept that we're going to maybe take multiple passes at that. So we're spiraling around delivering multiple evolving prototypes. We'll talk about evolving prototypes in a minute. Of, of the software as we go. So we're kind of learning as we go. Now, this model comes courtesy of Barry Boehm, um, and it's been hugely influential in software development and, the, and, and in the design of software development methodologies. It's extremely rare now to see a methodology that doesn't incorporate the ideas of the spiral model in some way, particularly this, this idea of evolving prototypes um, and that we're taking multiple passes at it. Um, now you'll notice in his model that at the end there's there's the operational prototype um and that kind of carries quite a lot of risk in itself that the, that the prototypes you're doing are not operational they're not production quality basically they're not production ready <coughs> excuse me um so but we're going to get onto that in a minute so the idea of evolving prototypes um, and around the same time maybe in the late 80s uh, a chap called Tom Gill um, um, wrote a book on software project management that uh, has been very influential because it it talks about this idea of, in, in his terms, evolutionary project management, where you're you're working towards a goal or trying to solve a problem, and you take multiple passes at solving the problem. Now, as you may be aware, I'm a big fan of this. I don't believe that software is necessarily about just delivering software. I think it's about solving a problem or achieving a goal. So this book had a, a big influence on me, and he's written multiple great books since then about evolutionary project management and this 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 approach he calls Evo, um, which is very goal driven. So it's not about software; the software is a means to an end, um, and I, I I really do appreciate that because that's had a big impact on me, um, and it had a big impact on quite a few other people as well. Uh, Tom has been described perhaps by some as the sort of the the father or the grandfather. Um, of um, agile software development in that respect. Um, so you check out his stuff. There's some really great ideas there. Um, okay, so this idea of, of uh, iterative development and of uh, and evolving prototypes really starts to take hold in the 1980s, and it's incorporated into many approaches to software development, many methodologies, big and small. And we'll talk about the big ones in a minute. Um, and just to sort of delve into that and um, take a look. So there's this, this idea of evolutionary prototyping. Now, I had some, some experiences with, a, with a, an approach to software development called rapid development, sometimes referred to as rapid application development or rapid prototyping. And uh, what we would do, which was better than nothing, but what we would do is we would build a sort of a, a low quality prototype. We would slap something together using some very friendly, quick technology like Microsoft Access or Visual Basic or something like that, so that we have something that we can show our customers pretty soon to get feedback from that. And then we'd, we'd gather their feedback um, and then we'd say, right, now give us 10 times that budget and we go away and build it properly in C++ or in Delphi or something like that. Now, you know what happens where there's, they've already spent quite a lot of money on a prototype. It appears to work. So nine times out of 10, they, they, they say, right, no, we're happy with the prototype. Thanks very much. It's the, the equivalent of going, going to a, a tailor's and you know when they're in there and they've got the suit sort of, it's not been sewn and not been made yet, but they're kind of, you know, with bits of paper and, and um, you know, safety pins sticking out and stuff like that, just to check that the measurements are all right and that they get the best fit. And we were kind of doing that in Visual Basic, for example, um, and then they were walking out of the shop wearing the prototype and not, didn't, didn't want us to make the actual suit. Uh, didn't want us to finish it. Um, and so there was a similar kind of thing happening. So we learned our lesson, which is that prototypes need to be production ready. 
they need to be ready to go because there's a very good chance that if, if the customer likes the prototype, they'll say, I'll take, I'll wear that out of the shop, please. And um, they'll take it. Um, so you kind of need to be ready to, for, for that. So it needs to be well designed and maintainable. It needs to be fully tested and you need to have some documentation if you need it and all of that kind of stuff that you need to think about. It needs to be production ready. And that's really what evolutionary prototyping is. Um, Evolutionary prototyping, prototyping, also known as breadboard prototyping, is quite different from throwaway prototyping. The main goal when using evolutionary prototyping is to build a very robust prototype in a structured manner and constantly refining it. The reason for this approach is that the evolutionary prototype, when built, forms the heart of the new system and the improvements and further requirements will then be built. What we're essentially describing here is the core of agile software development. It's evolutionary prototyping. It's evolutionary design in that sense, um, but in a very specific way in the sense that, that, that the software, that the prototype we're creating is the end product at every point in time, and it needs to be good enough to ship it if we have to, um, for the customer to wear it out of the shop, basically. Okay, um, so that's the core of that. And that um, informs in particular um, methodologies like extreme programming, which we're going to talk about in a minute. But before that, we need to look at the, the other side of this, which was, to some extent, um, agile software development was just a refinement of this idea of evolutionary prototyping. But to, there's more to agile than, than just the way that we design and deliver software. There's also the way that teams are structured, the way they're organized, the way that, that these projects and products are managed. Um, and much of that is a response to something else that was going on in the 1990s. And probably the, the best example of that um, sort of it borrows from structured programming and structured analysis, these ideas from the 1960s and 1970s that first brought structure to the software development process um, and tackled those kinds of risks. But they are a they pervert it. Basically, they are a perverted version of that that really are not about designing and delivering good software they're about management and when anything's about management as a, as a kind of goal an end in itself nothing good can come of that so let's take a look at this thing called the structured systems and analysis design method okay where did we find there we go so there's its wikipedia entry ssadm is a waterfall method right I, let's just stop them there <laughs> SSADM is a waterfall method, that thing that Winston Royce warned us about for the analysis of design of, of information systems. SSADM can be thought to represent a pinnacle of the rigorous document-led approach to system design and contrasts with more contemporary agile methods, oh boy does it, such as DSDM or Scrum. We'll talk about Scrum in a minute. Um, SSADM in one particular implementation uh, is one particular implementation and builds on the work of different schools of structured analysis and design, basically, hence the name. But I would argue that they are a perversion of it with very, very specific aims. What are the real aims of SSADM, I wonder? The name Structured Systems Analysis and Design Method and SSADM are registered trademarks of the Office of Government Commerce, which is an office of the United Kingdom's Treasury. Let's take another take a look at another web page about SSADM. Um, let's see if we can find it. What is SSADM? SSADM is a widely used computer, well no it isn't, um, is a widely used computer application development in the UK, development method in the UK, where its use is often specified as a requirement for government computing projects. Now that's all you need to know about SSADM. Consider the UK government's track record of delivering complex software systems over the decades. Not great, not good at all. And when they actually need something done, they go to um, departments like the Government Digital Service, GDF, who, surprise, surprise, do agile software development <laughs> most of the time or when they get the chance. Um, so I've had to work within the, the, the very rigid constraints of SSADM, and it is not pleasant, particularly for, for software developers and testers and people like that, the people doing the work because you have very little autonomy. Everything is very, very sort of narrowly defined for you in terms of your role. 
you don't see the bigger picture very often there is no bigger picture um, and the, the amount of documentation you're creating seems to obfuscate the fact that there is no bigger picture that nobody knows what the goal is supposed to be nobody knows who the customer is and so on and so forth so i would urge you even if you're not doing agile software development stay away from things like ssadm but these kinds of very management heavy document-led very bureaucratic, hierarchical, rigid software development processes, the big processes, the big methods, were beginning to dominate in the 1990s. And for one reason only, as far as I can see, and that is money, moolah. You need a lot of people. There are a lot of roles. It costs a lot of money. If you're a big consultancy, extreme pro programming or, or crystal or one of those methods is probably not the way to go for you because that's small self-organizing teams. We'll talk about that later as well. Um, and you don't make a ton of money from it. Um, you can make a ton of money doing big methods that have many processes, many activities, where there are many roles, many hats to be worn. Um, and that, as far as I'm concerned, is the real true purpose of things like SSADM. Now, at the same time, and it's probably a little unfair to single them out, another sort of, it was considered heavyweight methodology, was the Unified Software Development Process, or the Unified Process. Let's just take a look at their Wikipedia entry. Um, I will post um, links to all of these web pages so you can take a look for yourself. So this emerged around the same time that object technology, object-oriented programming and component-based development were really taking home, um, hold those component-based architectures in the mid-1990s. And the unified process, uh, sometimes referred to as the rational unified process, because that's the company that owned it, um, was not intended to be like the process, like you, you get the, the document and go, let's all do this. It was intended to be a framework, like a toolkit for defining um, the development process back in the days that we felt they need to be defined. So this was the toolkit you'd use to define the activities and the roles and the phases of your project and the milestones and the, the artifacts, the documents, the code and so on and so forth. And I kind of bought, I, I drank that Kool-Aid for quite a while and worked um, for a number of clients, uh, including Symbian. That's the last time I did it as a software um, process engineer or as a Symbian called me the development system architect, rather highfalutin term. So my, my job basically was to tell all the engineers how to do their jobs. And that went really well. Anyone have a Symbian phone, by the way? Whatever happened to Symbian? Um, and um, it is unfair to criticize the unified process as being heavyweight in the same way as a, it's unfair to criticize a, a, a dictionary um, as having you know, too much information. The, the idea is you don't sit there and read through the whole dictionary. The idea is you don't do the whole of the unified process. You customize it, you tailor it to your organization's need to that particular product. And so there are many variations, including very lightweight, agile variations, like Eva Jacobson's uh, Essential Unified Process and things like that. So it's probably unfair criticism, but it did earn a reputation because, again, money and consultants came in and they tended to dominate this space. So I worked with a lot of people who were doing what I was doing, software process engineering and consulting on the unified process, who had never been software developers. They were coming from management backgrounds or business backgrounds. Um, and back in those days, it was kind of similar to the agile coaching thing these days, like everybody, people sort of working in marketing, and then the next day, suddenly they're an agile coach. There were people working as business analysts, and the next day, they were suddenly software process engineers and rational unified process experts. And I don't think that was ever really intended. So it's probably unfair criticism, but it did. That's the way it went, because it kind of leaned in that direction. And, um, and it lent itself to that, and that's why it earned that reputation in the same way that the UML, which I used to teach and I still use on a regular basis, the unified modeling language, which came from the same people who came up with the unified process. Um, they were called the Three Amigos, so they were very influential in the mid-90s in, in object technology and object-oriented software engineering. So that's Jim Rumbaugh, Eva Jacobson, and Grady Booch. Still all around, but they've kind of not disowned all of this stuff, but they've kind of distanced themselves from the heavyweight element of it. And of course, the other thing about these is they, they feature computer-aided software engineering, as did SSADM, very heavily. Um, and that was a great way to sell very expensive tools. I used to, when I worked in banks, they would give me, I would insist on it, they would give me the rational suite, not just rational rows, the UML modeling tool, but the whole suite of tools for requirements and for um, um, configuration management and all that kind of stuff. And I think a, a seat of that cost for one developer cost about $30,000. So big business. Um, so that kind of pushed in a certain direction. So to some extent, people were 
um, were pushing back on that. But there's there's one um, um, methodology in particular that emerged at around the same time as the, the unified process. I think it predates it slightly. That was very, very different. Had all of the good stuff. And there's nothing wrong with the unified process. It is iterative and evolutionary. They do recommend continuous testing and keeping your code shippable and all of this stuff. Um, so, so it has all it's it's it's, it's making all the right noises on the on the cover, um, but it was very easily abused um, by the same people who are abusing agile today, very probably. Um, um, so, I'm going to talk a little bit about this thing called extreme programming. Let's go to the extreme programming homepage, extremeprogramming.org. Um, the first extreme programming project started March 6, 1996. That's a very good memory um, that someone has there. Extreme programming is one of several popular agile processes. It has already been proven to be very successful at many companies. I know this to be a fact of all different sizes and industries worldwide. And I've seen it applied to a very wide range, probably the most versatile of all the approaches to software development. And one of the reasons, is, of course, is because you can adapt it, you can evolve it, and you can customize it yourself. And that's very much part of the way that it works. Um, so this is a very highly iterative process. Um, at the core of it is the idea of evolutionary prototyping, that on a very regular basis we are producing working software, working production-ready software, that when the point the customer says, OK, I'll take that, we're ready to ship it at that point. So this idea of continuous delivery, we are continuously delivering working software. Um, and much of the technical practices of extreme programming um, test-driven development and unit testing, um, and also customer tests, so automated customer tests, um, refactoring and all those, and, and continuous integration, build automation, all that stuff. At the core of that is a sort of a technical heart, an engine, if you like, that is optimized to deliver working production-ready software. Um, again and again and again and again. But it's also sort of surrounded by stuff that you might say is a bit more touchy-feely, the way that the team interacts with each other, the way that the team works. So some very key ideas, some very influential ideas here about how the team should be self-organizing, how the customer should be working with the team directly every day, um, you know, face-to-face, -face, as it were, um, that they should be setting a sustainable pace and so going home at, you know, at the end of the day and not working silly hours and all of that kind of these very, very influential ideas that we're going to see when we look at the the Agile Manifesto very much at the core of it, at the heart of it. Now, extreme programming really started to catch on in the late 90s when people like Kent Beck and Ron Jeffries and Ward Cunningham started speaking about it publicly. So I saw Kent speak at, um, at events in the UK and it had a big impact on me because I was knee deep in these very heavyweight, um, laborious, hierarchical, um, rigorous, document-led processes and really not enjoying it very much at all. And so when someone sort of, you know, took took the mark, you know, took my, my blinkers off and said, well, here's this other way of doing it, it immediately resonated, particularly test-driven development, because I'd had some experience applying formal specification and formal methods techniques, and it looked damn familiar to me. Um, so I was really attracted to the lightness of it and the informal sort of nature of it, but at the same time at how technically rigorous it was. And I really felt you could deliver some really high-integrity software working this way. I think, and I, I've seen, I've, I've seen and done it over the years. Um, now, the reason it's called extreme programming, it is a bad choice of name from a marketing perspective, because if you want to sell something to management, you don't put the word extreme in it. And um, they are usually very risk averse, and nobody got rich selling extreme, um, usually. Um, but the reason it's called extreme programming is not because we're all shouting at each other or because it involves dangerous sports or anything like that. Although it can, if you if you want to adapt it that way, you can you can do it snowboarding if you like. Um, it's called extreme because what they did was they sort of recognized all the things that they'd seen the best programmers do that added value, like continuous testing, continuous automated testing, for example. And on those practices, they turned the dial up to 11, basically. Um, and then things that weren't adding value, like architecture documents, for example, of which I, I wrote quite a few, um, they turned the dial down to zero. So hence extreme. All the good stuff up to 11, all the, bad, all the stuff that doesn't make any difference or that actively hurts you, down to zero. Highly iterative. At the core of it, technically evolutionary prototyping. That's essentially what it is. But it's also about small, empowered teams working directly with their customers face-to-face, -face, having that face-to-face -face relationship um, and about recognizing that we are humans, that, that, that we should only work so many hours that before we burn out and so on and so forth. So setting that sustainable pace. 
and it really resonated. So it caught on pretty fast with the core of people here in the UK. I believe the first um, team to, to try and do all of it was a team working at a company called Connextra. I think they're one of the online betting companies now. Um, and many of the names on that team, you might recognize if, if you do a search of, for example, the Agile Alliance's website, you'll see names like Rachel Davis, Steve Freeman, um, uh, Tim McKinnon, um, Nat Price, and, and many other people that we now consider, well, they are very influential within the Agile community here in the UK and across the world. Rachel was the chair of the Agile Alliance, the Global Agile Alliance, for a couple of years, I think. Um, they started a, a conference here called, um, uh, they started a club, really, at the Extreme Tuesday Club that would meet every Tuesday. I think it's every other Tuesday now. Um, and that's been hugely influential as well. So there's a big community here, and they were kind of at the core of it. I tried some of the techniques. I was just really, really taken with test-driven development. So I, I kind of tried that first, dipped my toe in the water. Um, and then eventually around uh, 2001, 2002, started to adapt adopt more of these practices until eventually I, you know by 2003 i was just vanilla xp basically i just do you know let's do extreme programming is the way that i approached everything um but i i kind of worked my way into it starting with the technical practices and then the whole thing so extreme programming has been hugely uh, influential but there have been many other um software design and management and, de and development methodologies that have that agile flavor to it, like Crystal and DSDM and feature-driven development and and Scrum, which is a, which is much more on the sort of management side of things, doesn't really have technical practices, but still very iterative and very evolutionary. Um, so this sort of little little community, this little family, this little ecosystem of what we would now recognize as agile software development methodologies started to appear in the 1990s. Now. By 2001, this, this sort of movement, if you like, had gained pace. And when movements gain pace, like the software craft movement, for example, a bunch of people, let's face it, usually middle-aged white guys, get together in a place, a hotel or a ski resort, and they write a manifesto. So let's skip forward to the Agile Manifesto for Software Development, or the Manifesto for Agile Software Development. Okay, so this is this is like the document that is the core of this movement. It's a, a ratification, an articulation and a ratification by the process of signing the... Um, the manifesto of the way that many, many people were beginning to believe software development was best done. So let's actually read the manifesto. This describes what agile software development really is. Um, not, it's not Scrum. It's not any of these things. It's not extreme programming, although there's a lot of XP in it. Um, it's really sort of much more high level than that, much more abstract. The manifesto for agile software development. We are uncovering we are uncovering better ways of developing software by doing it and helping other others do it. In other words, you don't get better at doing software development by reading books or talking to consultants, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, necessarily, you do software development and you help other people do it. Um, through this work, we have come to value, and here's the core of it: the agile values. Individuals and interactions over processes and tools. So people basically talking to each other rather than having methodologies and handovers and processes and roles and milestones and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Working software over comprehensive documentation. At the end of the day, we've built what we've built, and it doesn't really matter what the document says. And I know for a fact, having worked in those kind of process roles and also working extensively as an architect. People don't read the documents, and I know this for a fact, because when the when document management systems started to get more sophisticated, I would track that and see who's actually accessed this architecture document. The answer was always me, basically me. So working software over comprehensive documentation so the customer can see what we've built and they can give us real feedback on what actually happened. Customer collaboration over contract negotiation. Now, this is really, really important. A lot of the reason we have heavyweight development methodologies because there's so much money involved is basically because we're kind of working in a them and us situation where it's almost confrontational and they're the people writing the software or delivering the software and the people who are paying for it uh, and a lot of it is contractual basically and that's why it ends up really complicated other industries that are very heavily contractual contractual and very litigious like the construction industry, for example, are also very heavyweight, very well-defined processes. But we would much rather work with our customers directly and basically just collaborate with them. We're both part of this design process. It's not them and us. We're in it together. We're both trying to solve the problem together, and we both have an interest in solving the problem. So if you can set up your contracts 
to be mutually um, rewarding in that way and to be risk sharing in that way, that we're both trying to get this done. We're both trying to solve the problem. And I've had it back in the early days, certainly in the, the, the late 90s and early noughties, I had developers take me aside and, and literally accuse me of trying to succeed as the, as the team leader or as the manager. Well, your problem, Jason, is you're trying to succeed. We're not supposed to try to succeed. We're supposed to cover our asses. Um, but in agile software development, we are setting out to succeed. We're setting out to give the customer what they need because it's in our, our interest and their interest. And finally, responding to change over following a plan. And this is at the essence of it, really, embracing change, basically. Change is good because it means that we're learning. So we should respond. We should invite and respond to that. And this is why evolutionary prototyping is so important because the best, the most meaningful response we can get and the most meaningful feedback comes from people using the real software for real uh, and then telling us, okay, this needs changing or this needs adding or whatever, and then we can learn and adapt from that. And that's, if you examine it, that's where most of the, the, the value in software comes from, not from the thing we did in the first release, but what we've learned from that thing and what we incorporated later. A, a classic example of this is Twitter. Twitter has so many features that were basically invented by the users, like hashtags, for example, and adding people to, to attract their attention. These things were invented by the users, not by Twitter. Twitter noticed and went, ah, that could be a feature. So they responded to that. And that's, that's really at the essence of agility, is responding to change. And that's why it's so important that teams need to be able to respond that, that basically you need to be able, if, if the business learns actually, you know, what would really be really good for this, um, if they have to wait two years to get that change, they've got a problem. So we need to be able to respond to that change quickly. And that brings in all the technical practices, for example, of extreme programming, and in particular, this idea of continuous delivery. Continuous delivery is really the core of ag agility. It's the core of agile, certainly on the technical side. That, and this is very important. That is, while there is value in the items on the right, we value the items on the left more. So they're not saying don't write documentation. They're not saying don't have, don't negotiate contracts. What they're saying is our focus needs to be on the stuff on the left, on those those face to face interactions between ourselves and with our customers, um, on working software um, delivered on a frequent basis, sustainably, um, on customer collaboration that we're we're in it together. We're on the same team. Um, over contract negotiation and on because if you if you haven't got that agile just isn't going to work um, and responding to change over so they're not saying don't have a plan but don't have a two-year detailed plan and don't spend all of your time updating it um, because believe me it's a waste of time have 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 a rough long-term plan this is these are the things we need to hit these are the milestones these are the goals uh, maybe a short detailed plan this is what we're doing for the next two weeks um, this is what we're doing today, et cetera, et cetera. But they're not, so they're not saying don't have a plan. They're saying don't grow too attached to your plan. It's going to change. Okay. And we can see some of the names here. That, that if you've been working in software development for any length of time, you will recognize the names of these um, folks who are at um, the Utah um, resort. Um, I think it's um, Snowbird. It's a ski resort in Utah um, in 2001, early 2001. Um, Kent Beck, um, Mike Needle, Harry Von Benicum, I can never pronounce that name, Alistair Coburn, Ward Cunningham, Martin Fowler, James Grenning, Jim Highsmith, Andrew Hunt, Ron Jeffries, John Curtin, Brian Marrick, uh, Robert C. Martin, Steve Meller, Ken Schwaber, Jeff Sutherland, Dave Thomas. So there's a mix there of people who are programmers and people who are not programmers. There's a mix there of extreme programming and Scrum and, and so on and so forth. Um, but all these people came together with a, with a sort of a single belief, if you like, which is that however we're doing it, there are some things we all seem to believe that we really buy into. And the, the manifesto kind of codifies that. Now, if you've not read the manifesto before, um, I strongly recommend you take a look at it. You can also, I, can you still sign it? I don't think you can anymore. I think they stopped taking signatures, but there are thousands and thousands of signatures. I haven't signed it. <laughs> um, but there are thousands and thousands of signatures. There are people, so many software developers, this resonated with us. We're like, well, yeah, obviously. Um, so it caught on pretty fast. Um, let's, I can't find my mouse. Where's my mouse? There we are. So slick, Jason. Um, okay, now, as well as the, the, the four agile sort of um, values, we need to talk about the, the Agile principles. So we're going into a bit more detail here. And this here's where we get into the, the stuff that looks kind of a lot like extreme programming. 
we follow these principles. Our highest priority is to satisfy the customer through early, and here's the phrase, continuous delivery of valuable software. Early and continuous delivery of valuable software. Welcome changing requirements even late in development. Agile processes harness change for the customer's competitive advantage. They are learning and we need to learn with them. We need to adapt and evolve their systems fast enough that they as a business can respond to what's going on, what they're learning. Um, really important for competitive advantage. Deliver working software frequently from a, a couple of weeks to a couple of months with a preference to the shortest time scale. Now, you may be aware that there are, there are businesses out there who are releasing every day or multiple times a day. Um, so that's really accelerated. And I think part of that is because computers are roughly a thousand times faster now. So that does help um, for building and testing your software. Um, business people and developer, oh, business people and developers must work together daily throughout the project. So this is really important. It is a direct relationship between the people writing the software and the people paying for it, or the people asking for it. That has kind of been lost, particularly in this idea of scaled agile or enterprise agile. Those hierarchies are coming back. We're going to talk about that later. Um, build projects around motivated individuals. Give them the environment and support they need and trust them to get the job done. Now, this is contentious because um, SSADM, for example, I think if we go back, it might even be there on that web page. In terms of what they're trying to achieve with SSADM, and it's nothing good, by the way, improve project management and control. There's a word. Make more effective use of experienced and inexperienced development stuff. So what they're trying to do is try and basically find ways that the less experienced developers can just color Paint by numbers, basically, colour between the lines. The reality is that doesn't work. It just doesn't work. Developers do need to be experienced. Now, you, you will be bringing less experienced developers onto the team, but for a different reason. But the idea of these heavyweight methods was, well, if it's all really well defined and documented and we've got all the boxes and arrows and everything, then the developers can just paint between the lines. They can just colour between the lines. Um, that has never worked. It has never worked. Unfortunately, developers still have to make design decisions and they have to make good decisions, even at the smallest level of design. Even the smallest dependency can have a huge impact. Um, ask anybody, ask any um, JavaScript programmer what adding more dependencies from Node can do, and it's so easily done um, that if you let inexperienced stuff just work unsupervised, you're going to be in, in trouble. Um, Make projects resilient to the loss of staff. This is where the, this is the, the documentation thing, and so on and so forth. So, um, but this idea basically that that on a, on an SSADM project you are not empowered. That's the whole point. You are not empowered. Teams are not empowered. Um, and um, if we go back and take a look at um, the Agile Manifesto, the Agile principles there. Um, the whole idea is that teams are empowered and they are enabled. You essentially, you hand them the company credit card and say, what do you need? What do you need from me? And that was the role of management in extreme programming, not to tell the developers what to do, but to give the developers what they need and to remove any obstacles that were getting in their way. Um, servant leadership, it's a very different role. You're essentially equal to the team. You're not in charge of the team. The team is in charge of the team and they're kind of in charge of you. And a lot of managers were not attracted to that, let's face it. Um, the most efficient and effective method of conveying information to and within a development team is face-to-face -face conversation. Now, obviously, as more and more of us are working remotely, the tools are going to have to improve. But the idea is the same, that, that a conversation is better than a document, usually. Um, working software is the primary measure of progress, not milestones, not metrics, etc., 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 not tasks completed, not Gantt charts or any of that stuff. It is working software. That's what we're here to deliver. Now, I would go one further than that and say solving the problem, the real problem, is the real measure of progress. But you're probably going to need working software to do that. So that's uh, agile processes promote sustainable development. The sponsors, developers, and users should be able to maintain a constant pace indefinitely. So that comes in, in several areas. There's the technical side of that, maintainability. How, how much does it cost to, to, to change the software? Because when it costs too much, that's going to slow the pace down very considerably. Um, but there's also the human aspect of that. Are we getting enough rest? Are we getting enough sleep? Are we working silly hours? And so on and so forth. So there is a human aspect to it, definitely. 
Continuous attention to technical excellence and good design enhances agility. All those technical practices and extreme programming are there for a reason. It's not developers being prima donnas um, and saying, well, if you're not writing unit tests, you're not a professional. Um, what it is, is people saying, we need to be able to test our software very quickly, which means our tests have to run fast, um, which means that we need our code to be very modular and so on and so forth. So, um, and when we're making changes, we need to make ch very small changes so we can retest it quickly. That's the whole point of those, those practices like unit testing and TDD and refactoring, continuous integration and so on and so forth. That's, that's the whole point of it, is so that we can sustain the pace of delivery. Um, and keep learning, basically, keep learning with our customer. Simplicity, the art of maximizing the amount of work not done is essential. That definitely doesn't describe SSADM. Um, the best architectures, requirements, and designs emerge from self-organizing teams. Now, at this point of the manifesto, this is where the managers start to panic. What does self-organizing mean? It means they're in charge of themselves, mate. It means they make the technical decisions. They decide, we, well, we're going to use this and we're going to use that. We're going to need these computers. We're going to need to be this kind of network. This is how, this is the, the the style of architecture we're going to use. This is when we're going to work. This is how we're going to work. These are the hats we're going to wear when we're working. Um, and if you're used to the idea of telling developers what to do, this is frightening, scary, because it undermines you. It threatens your position. It threatens you in the hierarchy. But hierarchies are an antithesis to agility. They really are. Lots of good writings recently from um, a friend of mine, Anthony Marcano, about this, that, that, that really you want self-organizing networks of people um, that can come together and achieve a goal and then disperse and come together and achieve another goal and so on and so forth. And for that to happen, they need to be able to essentially, you know, set the, the, the parameters that they're working within. They need to be in charge of themselves. Uh, and, but obviously to, the, the, to people in hierarchies, high up in the hierarchies, this can, be, this can seem very threatening. Um, takes a certain kind of confidence to say, no, I'm going to let the team figure it out. And I know I've worked with many managers uh, over the years who have been really good at that, who've been very sort of humble about it and said, no, my, my job is just to remove the obstacles and give them what they need um, and protect them from, the, from the, 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 the harsh winds and the rains of the, um, of the, of the organization. Um, but they, they figure it out for themselves. They know what, what's best. Um, and that's why I hired them, because I trust them. That's why trust is so important. But you can see why the world of SSADM and so on and so forth started to push back very quickly on this, very quickly. Um, and finally, at regular intervals, the team reflects on how to become more effective. So there's out-of-the-box extreme programming, which I always recommend is, well, let's start with that. If it's a new team and I've not worked with these people before, but we all know XP, it's a nice touch point. Well, out-of-the-box, let's just do vanilla, buy the book XP, see what happens. But then you need to adapt. It's not always appropriate. You need to start adding things and changing things and changing the way that you work to suit your particular situation. So it's very context driven as well. And that's why teams need to be self-organizing. They need to be making those decisions because when they have to keep referring those decisions up, particularly when the adaptations that they're making to the way that they work threaten the hierarchy, um, then um, life can become very difficult. So that you need teams that you can trust who can figure it out for themselves. Okay, so at regular intervals, the team reflects on how to become more effective, then tunes and adjusts its behavior accordingly. So retrospectives, for example, provided you're actually acting on the feedback from the retrospectives. So that is the Agile manifesto. That is the core of Agile software development. It was then and it still is now. Now, in the intervening 20 years since this manifesto was written, um, like I said, the, the, um, the hierarchy has pushed back, and they pushed back hard. Not only pushed back in terms of trying to reject, in particular, the, the team-based stuff, empowering teams and so on and so forth, but also pushing back on the emphasis on evolutionary prototyping done by self-organizing teams working directly with customers, pushing back on that and trying to make Agile all about what the way that teams are project managed. So basically, the project office said, no, 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 we can do this Agile thing. They all went out, and again, I'm not criticizing Scrum, but in the same way that the unified process kind of lends itself to um, perversion, it kind of lends itself to being abused. Um, agile processes and methods that, that focus on the way teams are managed um, have a tendency to lend themselves to empowering the managers, not the teams. Not Scrum's fault. 
I'm sure they, they, they'll be very clear, people like Ken Schwaber, that you're not supposed to do this in the same way that I'm sure Eva Jacobson would be very clear that this is not how you're supposed to do the unified process. Um, and, uh, but it kind of has gone in that direction. Um, agile, the agile industrial complex, as it's described, that's grown up over the last 20 years, is mostly, as indeed Big Process was in the 90s, software process engineering, it's kind of the same forces. It's money, basically. Money has taken over. And so we get these big agile transformations where dozens and dozens of people calling themselves agile coaches come in, many of whom were the process, the software methodology experts of the 90s, um, and not the actual people who wrote the code, um, like the Grady Boochers of this world, um, but the people who, who were selling that snake oil back in the 90s, um, who are now selling new snake oil, because this new snake oil is, is considered more trendy and acceptable. Um, but it's the same old, same old, in the sense that what we're seeing now is things purporting to be agile methodologies that are actually the, the, the modern-day equivalent of SSADM. They are hierarchical, they are rigid very often, um, they empower management, they empower the hierarchy and not the teams, um, and so on and so forth. And I'm sure the people who develop these methodologies would argue that's not the case, but they certainly lend themselves to it. They lend themselves to it very strongly. So anyway, that is what agile software development is. As it, At its core, it is rapid evolutionary prototyping of working software, software that is production ready, that's shippable. Um, and all the technical practices of Agile, like um, unit testing and TDD, like refactoring, like continuous integration and deployment automation and all that kind of stuff, they are all pointing towards this idea of continuous delivery of working software and sustaining the pace of that delivery. But built around that are the human aspects of trust, of self-organization, of close face-to-face -face collaboration, albeit virtual these days. There's still much that we can do face-to-face -face over Zoom or Teams, God help us, um, and, and Miro and things like that. Um, and very importantly, the customer and the developers are on the same team. We're all trying to solve the problem. And we're learning our way to that solution, which is really, we've discovered, since the 1960s, since those early days of this thing called software engineering, what we've discovered is that's usually the best way to do it. It's usually the only way to do it successfully. And that's why methodologies like extreme programming have been more successful in real terms. So there you go. That's what agile software development is. And a potted history of the idea of development methodologies, iterative and evolutionary development. So if you're new to software development or you've just not heard this stuff before, I hope that's been, a, um, you know, it's shown a bit of light on where agile software development has come from. What will be interesting, the interesting discussion, you can answer me in the, the comments below, is where do you think software development is going next? What's after Agile? Um, who knows? Um, but in the meantime, I wish you well. I hope you're all safe. I've had my third, I've had my booster jab, so now I have the ability to reverse time or something. I don't know how, quite how the booster jabs work. Um, but anyway, winter is coming. Um, stay safe, stay warm. Um, get your jab. Um, and... Um, until the next video diary.